Hello everyone, this is Michael Michaelidis from Ancient Greece Revisited and this is yet another book review because you requested it. Um, today I want to talk about a book uh, that's very dear to my heart and very important without necessarily agreeing with its conclusions. It's Descartes' Discourse on Method. Now, many think of Descartes as a mathematician but that's only because they have a very restrictive view of philosophy. Um, I'm someone who considers myself a philosophical supremacist, which is a term that I borrowed from um, a friend and teacher, Michael Millerman. And, and what that means is that I believe that philosophy is number one, uh, kind of like Trump said, America number one. I believe philosophy number one, uh, not because I would like philosophy to be number one or I think it should be, but I think that it actually is. And what this means, especially in the context of this review, is that for someone like me, science is a byproduct of philosophy. Not just historically. It doesn't mean that science was just happened to be created by people who were philosophers. It means that to function, it needs some basic assumptions about the nature of reality that it, science itself, cannot prove and needs another system of thought that we call philosophy, to be based on. And it was in just this big turn of events during the early Enlightenment that Descartes created an entire philosophy that would actually give birth to modern science. It's very difficult to understand the extent of what he did just by reading this small book, which is 40, 45 pages in most print editions and can be read uh, in a day by most of you, um, it's very difficult to understand what actually happens there because what actually happens is tremendous. The book is mainly written as an introduction to Descartes' works, which are mathematical to an extent, philosophical to a more encompassing extent. And it starts by his own biography, right? So it's very modern in the sense that we encounter uh, a type of vagabond, a person who studied in what today we'd call Ivy League universities of his days, a Jesuit school, where he studied all the ancient philosophers, to which he doesn't necessarily name, but we can imagine including Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, all, 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 all of the knowledge that we in ancient Greece revisited, essentially trying to bring about, bring forth in a new light. And he rejected them. He said that very characteristically in this work, he says that what these ancient philosophers did is to build with their words an entire palace, beautiful, majestic, but ultimately built on nothing but sand. So no real foundations. Um, it's almost like saying that what Plato, Aristotle, they, was just words, words, words. They just created beautiful theories, but with not much foundation, which ironically, is the idea that many people today have a philosophy, a bunch of interesting, deep words with no much significance, right? So you find this opinion very early in the Enlightenment that what the ancients did were, did not have any grounding, was not a rigorous system. And then he continues to say that it was only through a small group that were called mathematicians that he, Descartes, find, found some rigor, he found some, some founding. And so he decided, he says, to build not a palace, because he's not that great of a man apparently, or is he, but just a house, small house, um, built on very solid foundations. Now, a lot of people fall for Descartes' alleged humility, because he says that, you know, he's no Plato himself, he can't build that palace. So just a house will do, again, very modern sensibilities. Um, we live at times that we don't like people who say big words and big, you know, big. Uh, we like the humble, we like uh, the small. So, so, sometimes we overreact to the other side and we admire someone like, I don't know, Conor McGregor. But that's more of a reaction to our basic line, which is keep humble, keep... So Descartes is very humble. And so he says, I'm only going to build a, a, a house, but we forget that he actually destroys an entire palace, right? He's humble when he builds, but he's not very humble when he destroys. And 
The entire line of thinking that follows is essentially a negation of the ancient world, right? So what Descartes then does is his famous, what do I know? He asks himself, what can I know, okay? And today we might say that he would use the example of the Matrix. Matrix as in the 1999 film, character trapped inside a virtual world, simulation, doesn't know what's real. If he had that language, I'm sure that Descartes would use it, but in his time, uh, that wasn't the language of his time, so he used the religious language, and he says, what if my whole existence was created by a, a dieu trompeur, in, in French, I remember, the, a deceiving god, right? So a god who was like a demiurge, we spoke about Gnosticism in another episode, so a demiurge, a, uh, a god that literally creates a false world for one person to be in and get tormented, a very bleak image. But he asks a legitimate question, like, how can I know? Like today, Elon Musk asks a similar question. He believes that we're in the simulation. So it actually starts from Descartes that, how do I know? How, how can I know if my sensations are real? And then he says the famous, I think, therefore I am, right? It's written in this book, it's written in other books. And uh, this is... Uh, something that's often misunderstood, but it, it's, it's very real in my un understanding, you know, because the idea is that even if I use this thinking to disprove my existence, I still disprove it through my own thinking, thereby confirming that I exist in some form, some form or another. Maybe I'm a brain in a jar that some mad scientist from another dimension has captured, or maybe I'm immaterial, but I am, I am in, in some part. Then he continues to do a, a, a move that a lot of people consider strange, which is to prove the existence of God. So already you have to take his alleged humility with a grain of salt, right? He does big things. He does a small house, but he does big things. Prove God. And there, he, 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 it's, it's not very important to go into the entire argument because this has been negated a few times. Essentially, he's trying to find a link between his being, which might be a brain in the jar, and the external world, and he connects it through God. It's suffice to say for this short video. Um, but again, he does something tremendous because, and he does something that Socrates did as well, which is to prove God, thereby satisfying the status quo of his time. So saying, I'm with you, I'm with the church, right? People were burned at the stake still during those days, you have to remember, really. So it was a dangerous thing to prove the existence of God. But if you base your, if, if you base your faith on proving God rationally, then in a strange turn of events, you actually put logic above God because you're implying that then if my logic disproved God, then God would not exist. If God exists because my logic can prove it, then if my logic proved otherwise, then God wouldn't exist. Then logic becomes the king and God becomes just like a byproduct almost. Again, you have to read these very simple texts with a lot of subtleties. A lot is happening. And then when he proves God and he, he, he turns to something that we might consider minor, but it was, it was again, very, he, he tries to describe how the human heart works. And uh, he, he does make a mistake. He thinks that essentially the heart works like a diesel engine, you know, with a little spray of liquid, like blood in the case of the heart, like diesel fuel in the case of the engine, a little spray of blood that then blood gets combusted somehow through the heat of the heart apparently. And then that creates the inflation of the heart. Then as this heat cools down, it deflates another sprinkle, literally like a diesel engine. And of course, he's wrong, at least technically, but still, it doesn't matter because what he's doing, he's describing the heart as a, as, as, as a, as a, as a material, mechanical, predictable thing. He opens the way for the full cyborgs that we're perhaps going to become not too long into the future. You know, if you believe that this flesh has something magical, then no factory can rebuild it. You know, if you believe that this form is sculpted in the form of God, as many did, then no, no human can recreate it. But if you believe that this is merely a machine, then yeah, we can create it, we can improve it, we can merge it with other machines. And funnily enough, that is exactly what he does at the end of his book. He goes on to describe cyborgs, which you might think is a crazy idea. In 1650, when he wrote that book, 
to talk about robots, but it's not because it follows from the basic premises. You have to remember that things that take centuries to materialize on the physical plane um, were preceded by thoughts that happened very early on. And the thought that Descartes presents us very naturally leads to cyborgs. If you understand the human body as a machine, why not be able to recreate it? Funnily enough, and very fitting to these chat GPT days, uh, what Descartes believed would be missing from this robot would be speech. So this robot would be able to perform, do cook, fight wars, run, but it wouldn't be able to speak, according to him, because there's something very human about speech. And I find it very ironic how it's almost like we've gone backwards and the first kind of sign of a fully autonomous agent is a speech-based agent, which is, as you probably already know, OpenAI's chat GPT before we even, even build the, the, the skeleton. Um, so really, you know, this book, it's enjoyable um, and you can dive into it, but it's important to remember that it opens up a new era right, which is our era, the modern era. And you have to remember that these philosophers are not always to be taken at their word.